you mentioned the that your work involves testing or testing the predictions of the standard model. So first, I think we should talk about what the standard model is quite broadly. And then second, you also mentioned that you studied the collision of protons and electrons in the Zeus experiment. Yeah. And collisions play a tremendous role in the exploration of the empirical exploration of particle physics. And I don't think it's obvious why that is to the lay person, why collisions are so important. So first, what is the standard model just roughly and, and why are collisions so important for studying it? Sure. So the standard model is essentially it's a a body of knowledge, a body of theory that that um encapsulates what we I guess it's the answer we have at the moment. So imagine imagine Starting with any piece of material, asking yourself this question, which people, people have done, some strange types of people in the past. If you start with any material and you break it in half and you break it in half again and you break it in half again and so on, how, you know, take the Zeno's paradox or whatever, <laughs> go, go, keep chopping it as far as, as much. The question is, does that process ever stop? Is it, do you reach an indivisible component of nature? And if so, or does it just carry on forever? And and if so, if you do stop, do you stop in the same place wherever you started from? Okay, so the other, so the, in, the bottom line is, are there a certain set of fundamental, if you like, indivisible constituents of nature? And of course, you know, we've had ideas about this, about, you know, the atom was first postulated as a, an indivisible constituent of nature. And we know now that it's not indivisible, but still a reasonable good model for, for a lot of physics, a lot of science, a lot of nature. And the particle physics is really just pushing that that envelope as far as you can, if you like. Are there fundamental constituents, constituents of nature? Um, and if so, what are they? And if so, what are the forces between them and how do they then combine to build the world around us? And the standard model, in a nutshell, is our best answer currently to that. Okay, that's what it is. It, it lays out what are the fundamental constituents of nature? What are the fundamental forces? How do they behave? And how does that lead to, you know, well, I mean, the electron is one of the fundamental, it's a, it's a fundamental player in the standard model. It's one, it's one of the, it's one of the, um, the fundamental constituents of, na of nature. And um, the quarks inside protons and neutrons are also fundamental players. And then the, the force of electromagnetism, which is um, carried by photons, which are quanta of light. All of these things are players in the standard model, and the standard model is essentially a mathematical formula in the end um, that lays out how these things relate to each other and how they therefore interact and how you predict what they're going to do next and explain the, the world around us. And, it, and it's incredibly successful at doing that. Hmm. Before I continue to, to probe this, I just want to get back to the Zeno's paradox that you yeah. mentioned at beginning and I, this is a bit orthogonal to where we're going but some of the questions some of the discussions i've had on the foundations of physics on this show and particularly quantum gravity we've talked about whether or not space is ultimately discrete or continuous so mm -hmm. causal set theory for instance uh, the fundamental constituents of reality are space-time atoms and space yep. is discrete and since you're in the business of cutting things in half forever and then getting smaller and smaller. I'm wondering if you have uh, a particularly strong opinion on the matter about whether or not these things will ultimately continue breaking down. But I guess this uh, question is distinct from whether or not space itself is continuing. Yeah, I mean, it seems... So I think what we do know is that things look very different when you get small enough and when and we, when you get to very high energies as well. And we can talk in a minute, if you like, about how those are essentially the same thing in a sense. But the And that's actually one of the conceits in the map of the invisible, actually, is you go far east, you go small, and you go up in energy. And they, they, right. So I think what we know is as you do that, the the world changes. So it doesn't make sense to think of things as particles in the same way we think of grains of sand or discrete objects like that you're in the world of quantum field theory and the people that you've been talking to who deal with string theory and quantum gravity and stuff are 
struggling with the fact that the quantum field theory is what we need to describe the standard model. And it can encapsulate infinitely small particles once you introduce things like the Higgs. It, it has a mathematically consistent picture that describes nature and is, and is okay. Um, with inf is okay with infinitely infinitely small discrete particles, so that Zeno's paradox doesn't carry on forever in the standard model. In classical um, theories, it would carry on forever, and the problem is that general relativity, which describes gravity, which is not accommodated within the standard model, is a classical theory. So, in classical theory, space is continuous, and you can divide it forever. In in the standard model energy and force and the particles are not not continuous they they break that they become quantized at some point and become quantum field theory and the, that's a problem we have in physics right we don't know the resolution and the people you've been talking to have been struggling with that it's a long way from at the moment from having ex empirical evidence um that will allow us to make sense of that unfortunately um, although you can always hope for a better experiment. Um, but my opinion is that in the end, and it is just an opinion, no, it's not based on evidence. My opinion is that, um, that probably the quantum picture is closer to the, to the, in the end, gravity will have to roll over and become quantized. And I think most scientists probably think that too. Um, mm -hmm. like to have an opinion, that's probably their opinion. Um, but we don't know, to be honest. Um, and uh, great general relativity is an absolutely beautiful theory that describes a vast array of stuff. Um, but in the end, it probably has to give way to some kind of quantum version where the classical version of general relativity that we see in nature is um, a, a lower energy approximation of, of an underlying theory. So it's just an opinion, but that's where I think, I think um, in the end, nature becomes quantized probably hmm. which okay, means great. the paradox stops right you can't divide the quantum up anymore mm -hmm. and then returning to your comment about energy and size uh, perhaps in our macroscopic world we think of energy increasing with size so maybe the the potential energy of a boulder hovering a foot above the ground is greater than a pebble at the the same altitude but this isn't the case with the microscopic or with waves for i mean like i think of yeah uh, radio waves and x-rays x-rays exactly. are much more energetic and it's it's about how the energy is shared out so when you when you make a boulder bigger then you're um you're, you've got more energy because you've got more matter, but you're sharing it out over more and more matter. So the energy per proton or per atom in that boulder isn't growing. You're just mm -hmm. adding more atoms which have energy. So it's more about energy density. It's about concentration at a point. And, um, and with a collider um, in the quantum world, there's a relationship between energy and wavelengths. So there's a, um, the de Broglie wavelength that's associated with any particle is the inverse of the momentum. So if you go to high momentum, which is like going to high energy, then you're going to a shorter wavelength. And the key, as you, as you alluded to, you know, with, with um, electromagnetic waves is, of course, if you want to see something really small, you need to probe it with a wavelength that is at least as small as the thing you're trying to see. Otherwise, it'll just be invisible or blurred out. Um, so if you want to see the smallest things in nature, you need the shortest wavelengths. And if you want to get a short de Broglie wavelength, you need super high momentum. And that's why we need these big colliders, basically, because they're the highest momentum particles we can get in a lab. And that's what, And then when we collide those beams together, we are probing nature with a shorter wavelength.